This video is kindly sponsored by NordVPN. Hello and a very warm welcome back to the garden. Today's video is full of low cost tips for organic pest control for your no dig garden. One of the things that perhaps upsets me the most is seeing gardeners really get put off because they're constantly battling against pests. So I thought I'd make kind of a really simple crash course showing a load of tips that you can apply for kind of common pests that you get in the garden. And then also planting and growing methods to help prevent issues happening in the first place. Firstly, I wanna start with actually listing five different crops that I feel show a really strong resistance to pests. So if you can't grow anything, at least try growing these and still enjoy nice homegrown food. Jerusalem artichokes, also known as sunchokes, these are known to be so resilient to any kind of pest issues. In fact, in Jadam, they use uh, Jerusalem artichokes and their tubers to create natural insecticides and pest deterrents. And they're also super productive, a really good pest resistant plant to grow. The second crop for me is beetroot. I've been growing beetroot for many, many, many years. I've got some golden beetroot coming through here and you can also eat the leaves as a really nice crop. It's kind of like a spinach alternative. But out of all of my years of growing beetroot, the only issue I've really had that's been serious with pests is late in the winter, some voles eating the roots. Apart from that, they've just been a really solid pest resistant crop. The third crop is actually a group of crops and it's annual herbs. I've got dill here as a prime example, also coriander and parsley. The reason why pests don't like these is that they're incredibly aromatic and it can put off a lot of pests. And I've, I've never had any issues with these three solid and productive and also beautiful crops. And I'd also throw borage into that mix as well. The next crop is actually garlic and it's because it's also like the other crops really really kind of potent and really strong. In fact you can use garlic in certain ways to actually prevent pests and prevent them from coming because it is so strong and it is just one of the best crops anyone can grow. And the fifth crop for me is actually dwarf French beans. They're kind of one of my favourite champions of the garden and I've done a whole video about them this year. I've never had any serious pest issues with them either. I'm now going to run through the ways that I naturally deal with some of the most common pests in a kitchen garden. So the first pest I want to cover is aphids or green fly and black fly. They're, they're very popular and they'll be somewhere in your garden, even if they're not causing an issue, they're part of the natural environment. Now I had an issue before with this, I've got this kind of broccoli, uh, sprouting broccoli, and also this um, Asturian tree cabbage, where they had a load of aphids in them when they were small seedlings, and I thought, oh no, this isn't good. But the easiest way to actually deal with aphids is to create a really nice soapy spray. So following the instructions and using a, a natural soap, you don't want any chemicals whatsoever, what it does is it, it coats the aphids, it stops them from, uh, basically stops them from working and it prevents any issues again. I only had to use one application on these and they've been aphid free ever since. Another pest that can actually cause issues in your garden, especially if you're growing fruit such as soft fruit like strawberries, is birds. They seem to love it. And there's a few different really simple ways of dealing with them. One of the easiest is using these things called CDs where apparently films used to be on them. But they're great because they're super cheap and you can flash them about and on what you do is you actually tie these to a, a series of strings and they just hang from somewhere high, like a, a top of a garden gate or an archway, and they just naturally, kind of in the wind, just swing about, and that actually scares birds, they don't like it. So if you're trying to protect a certain area, putting up some of these and works really well, as you can tell, because if I was a bird, that would certainly annoy me. So the next pest is probably the one that kind of gets talked about the most, and it's slugs and there's a couple of really simple things that you can do firstly in terms of prevention. The first is to actually grow seedlings on fairly big before putting them out because when you're looking at them 
if they have a little bit of damage, you have time to act because the whole plant is not destroyed. Whereas with, say, a row of lettuce like that, if you're direct sowing and the little seedlings are just appearing, they could get nibbled and destroyed right away. Letting plants grow bigger allows them to ride a slug onslaught for a little longer so then you can take the next steps. So one of the easiest ways to deal with slugs is to create a very simple slug trap using something like a plank and some water. So I've got a courgette here and slugs are known to like things like courgettes. So what you do kind of at the end of kind of an afternoon is you give a space of water and then you put a plank down, not too hard, just put it down and leave it and then the following morning turn it over and chances are you'll have some slugs underneath and it's just a really useful way of getting rid of slugs from a certain area. You can just pick them off and remove them. Now on a YouTube video I did about the plank method, I actually had a commenter say that apparently during the Victorian times they used to use rhubarb leaves and place those on the ground and use those as slug traps as well. And now because it's the end of the rhubarb season, it's a great use for some of these leaves. Not all though, because they need them to store and capture the energy ready for next year. Another very simple way of preventing a lot of slug damage is actually using Bits of these, this is from uh, blackberries, wild blackberries, the canes. They're so spiky and I can uh, feel them, and they're not exactly the most pleasant. And if you just think like a slug for a bit, if you're a slug and you're up against a barrier like that, you'd have to be out of your mind to try and cross it. And so placing these down to create kind of fences so I could fence off this area of a lettuce is a really, really simple way of actually helping to prevent slugs from coming in and eating your little seedlings. By using these spiky canes, you're going to block slugs from entering your salad patch, just like you want to block malware from entering your digital devices. Malware is a type of digital pest that you don't want on your phone or your computer. But fortunately, there's a simple prevention that you can use to keep malware away, and that's NordVPN. But NordVPN is more than just a very powerful cybersecurity tool. Let me give you a visual. You know when you're on YouTube or Instagram and you see gardeners in other countries growing these amazing looking vegetable varieties that you really want but you can't access? Well, the same kind of thing happens when you're online and you find a really interesting show you want to watch. You click it and then it says, sorry, not available in your country. However, whilst it can be pretty tricky or impossible to get seeds internationally, with NordVPN, I can go on the map, click on the location I want access from, and within seconds, start watching what I want. This also means that if you're going on a summer holiday or traveling abroad, you can still watch the things that you love from back home. On the subject of going abroad or trips or even down to your local cafe, and you use the public Wi-Fi there, well, your personal data is at risk from the prying eyes of the commercial operator, or even worse, and it's a pest that I think is worse than slugs, hackers. But using NordVPN keeps your public internet activity secure and private, just how it should be. So if you're on Android, Apple, Linux or Windows, keep your devices pest-free by using my exclusive 30-day risk-free NordVPN deal at nordvpn.com forward slash Richards. And now back to garden pests. So yesterday I was visiting a gardener called Jack First and he's written a book about hotbeds and he's kind of thought up of what I think is one of the coolest slug preventing ways of growing food and we filmed it for a video that's coming out in December but I thought we share it here as well. He's basically, you can use things either like a table with four legs, he's used an old wheelbarrow and you put these in buckets and you fill those buckets, you put the legs in the buckets and you fill those with water and then salt. So it's a salty water, slugs do not like that. And then what it means is if you create a growing on the top, whether it's in pots or you create a little bed that's raised up, it's protected from slugs ever getting up there. So that was, I just thought was a real genius idea and it's something that you could do. And it also means that raising it up, it saves your back as well. 
If you've suffered from cabbage root fly damage before, what you can do is you can create these collars out of cardboard and put them at the base. And what this does is it stops the carrot root fly coming through and going down and laying the eggs. And it's the maggots that cause all of the damage. You can also do the exact same thing with bits of old rubber, like old wellies. Perhaps my least favorite pest in the garden is carrot root fly because you're growing these beautiful carrots and then suddenly they cause carnage and you can't enjoy any of it whatsoever. So my way of working around it is just using varieties like resistor fly or fly away, which show really good carrot root fly tolerance, which is very, very much welcome. Another workaround that you can do is that they usually fly quite low, so under two foot or 60 centimeters. So you can build some kind of barrier with really fine mesh or even bed sheets around to stop them coming in. Another frustrating pest is a really small one. It's called flea beetle, and it's these tiny black beetles that seem to love lots of different brassicas. So things like turnips and radish and kale, for example, is where I've had it in the past. Now, flea beetles, yes, it doesn't look very nice, but kind of nine times out of 10, they're not actually gonna cause much of an issue, if at all, with the yield. It just doesn't look very aesthetically pleasing. What I would say is if you see flea beetles, you just wanna make sure that the plants are watered nicely, might need to give them a bit of supplemental feed to help boost them and their health, but there's never been a case that I can think of where flea beetle have actually destroyed a crop and I haven't been able to eat it. So it's something to just live with. A slightly larger pest, a mammal in fact, a uh, voles and also mice, they can cause quite a bit of an issue, both in terms of eating seedlings and seeds in the polytunnel, but also burying around and kind of sniffling about in raised beds. Now, whatever trap you want to use, I found that either peanut butter or chocolate spread are two absolute favorite uses as bait. So, even just a third of a teaspoon is all you need to use as a bait in a trap. On the subject of mammals or rabbits, which can be quite a big issue, and they love a lot of the food that's inside the garden. And what you've got to do is think like a rabbit. So rabbits, if they come up against an object, for example, a fence, they will bury directly beneath it to try and get underneath. So you've got to think of a fence like an L. If they're trying to get in on that kind of 90 degree kind of angle there, what you've got to do is protect that. Now you could either kind of bury some kind of chicken wire underneath and it will kind of maybe distract them. What we use, and it's low cost because it, it will last forever, is we use this special 18 gauge rabbit proof wire netting that we actually bend out at the bottom and then cover with soil. So when the rabbits start digging in, they just come against this wire and there's no way that they can chew through that. I've just shared some of the real simple ways that you can deal with some of the pests and there's almost unlimited ways. However, I don't think there's anything that's more important than actually breeding and kind of bringing in your own anti-pest army and that's through biodiversity. For me, nature is my best pest control because nature is about balance. It wants to create an equilibrium. And for me, it's actually about creating the spaces, i.e. growing plants that encourage lots of different beneficial insects into the garden. So things like parasitic wasps, for example, are an excellent thing that you need to deal with all sorts of things. For example, aphids or cabbage white caterpillars. And to bring in those, you need the flowers. You need lots of different flowers. And it's just a real nice magnet to pull nature and wildlife into your garden and then give it a space to get to work and use its magic. By growing things such as annual herbs and letting those flower, growing annual edible flowers, letting some of your vegetable flowers, my favorite are leeks, for example, when they flower, it looks amazing. All of these things which you can eat at the same time are recruiting every single day. They're recruiting nature to come in to help deal with your pests. And I think that that is just really empowering, creating the space for nature, for your anti-pest army, but making it also look beautiful, doesn't cost you anything at all, and it makes such a big difference. 
Another really simple way of reducing pest damage in the garden is actually confusing pests. So by using techniques such as interplanting or not, putting all of your eggs in one basket by planting, for example, here I've got a patch of onions in this area of the garden and I've got another patch of onions at the bottom end. Just make it harder. You're not sacrificing any space. You're just swapping things around a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle and that just confuses pests further and it makes it harder for them to take over and destroy a whole crop. So it's actually creating and building security within your garden and also for your belly. <laughs> Keeping down on pests in the garden also requires the skill of observation. And I actually enjoy the process of hand watering because it gives me an opportunity to just look at the plants and just see how they're doing. So whenever you're watering your garden or if you just want to have a tea break and a little mooch about, it's a great opportunity to just check the health of your plants. And if you see any potential pest damage, you're then made aware of it rather than realizing when it's perhaps a little bit too late. The overarching theme of having fewer pests in the garden always comes down to soil health. Soil health is, is a fundamental, it is literally what makes or kind of breaks a garden and the healthier the plants the less pest damage because pests in a way, in nature's way of showing where there's weakness, where there's weak plants. They target weaker, easier plants than nice, healthy ones. And so by focusing on soil health, you're going to naturally create a more pest resistant garden. The easiest way of making soil health better is by making and applying compost. But you might be a little bit low on compost by this time of year. But don't worry, there's seven ways in this video to show you how to still grow food, how to still promote soil health without needing compost. Seven alternatives to promote healthy soil, healthy plants, and then fewer pests.